Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches puts a net over our water garden to get a jump on the falling leaves. We continue our tour of gardening in northwest Oklahoma with a stop at the Garfield County OSU Extension Center in Enid for a tour of their Master Gardener Demonstration Garden. Also in Eated, we find out how the wildflowers that we saw earlier in the season are harvested and processed by Johnston Seed Company. And OSU Assistant Extension Specialist Shelly Mitchell has a fun children's activity to see the different colors within green leaves. As the weather starts to cool down, we often enjoy these shorter days by getting back out into our garden. But those cooler temperatures also mean that the leaves are gonna start dropping off of the trees. And before they get too severe, we wanna make sure to cover our water garden to prevent those leaves from going to the bottom of the pond. When those leaves do settle at the bottom, they often decay and release toxic gases for our fish. So in order to prevent that, we're gonna put a covering or a netting over our pond. And there are several different ways to go about this. Um, there's a lot of different products on the market that you can find. Um, some come with fiberglass poles that actually kind of create a tent or a canopy over your water garden. And then some are just nets that will lie parallel to the water surface. One thing you wanna keep in mind is the size of the holes on your net. So you want to also consider what trees you have around, whether you have large oak leaves or maybe you're trying to prevent pine needles from getting into your water garden. Because this might not do as well for pine needles, but it will do well to protect those large leaves. There's also nets that might have grommets on the ends so that you can secure it better around your water garden. But this is just a simple fruit net um, that we use over our fruit trees to protect them from birds that we're also gonna put over our water garden. So it can be just that simple. What we're gonna do is stretch this over our water garden and you might notice that we still have some tropical plants and that's okay. The forecast is showing that the temperatures are still gonna be pretty nice out. And the nice thing about this netting is it's pretty thin so it doesn't distract from us uh, enjoying our water garden and our water features still. When the forecast changes and we start to see that there's gonna be cooler temperatures in our future, we'll of course take in our tropical plants into our greenhouse. If you have tropical bog plants or water plants that you want to save, you also will want to bring those into a warmer environment. If you're going to just let them pass for the year and buy new ones next year, then you still want to make sure to remove them out of your water garden for the winter time, just for the same reason that you want to remove those leaves that might be falling from your trees. This is when a little effort will save you a headache later. Garfield County at the OSU Extension Office and joining me is Jenny Gwinnup who is the county uh, master gardener president. Yes. And Jenny you guys have been busy out here it looks like. We this have is been. Part of your demonstration garden. Yes this is the start of our demonstration garden and we've been probably the last 20 years we started this organization and so this is the very beginning just what's around here around the extension office and we've started with a lot of Oklahoma proven plants and then we have just expanded over the last couple of years. So right here we're so. in full sun surrounded by concrete against a brick wall so we've got some really hardy plants yes. here. 
And, and there's a lot of color. A lot of color, especially right now with the heliotropes blooming and spreading, and it's just, you know, very attractive, I think. So, uh, if you're a lover of blue, which I am. Yeah. <laughs> so how many master gardeners do you have in this county right now? Uh, we have about 60 members okay. currently. So with 60 so. members, you couldn't just stop with this small of a garden, right? No, we had to keep going, <laughs> and yes, so we always have wonderful ideas from our gardeners, and they're just willing to share, and that just makes it special for all of us. And you've actually grown beyond on the extension office to your yes. demonstration yes. garden. Yes, right. So up by the extension office you had more of a landscape, but this is more demonstrating different ways of gardening. Exactly. You've got a keyhole uh, garden. We have a keyhole <laughs> garden. And as you know, we, you know, we put our um, grasses and other things mm -hmm. from our gardens in the center, and that leaches out to help fertilize the plants that are on the outside. And um, so we just tried different things, some radishes, some tomato plants, um, some peppers that are recently planted. Yeah, they just got they, they just, just got, got in this morning <laughs> with some marigolds, and so they, with this wonderful... We're um, all wilting a little bit. We're all wilting a little bit. <laughs> so, um, and beyond us, you've got a pollinator garden, it looks like. We over have there. a pollinator, a pocket po um, pollinator garden, okay. parrot garden. So, and you yes. seeded that? Or? We seeded that. We, we decided to put down some black tarp for several months and kind of cook everything, get rid of the weeds. Uh -huh. And uh, then after that, we removed the tarp and started putting down, we used some Johnson seeds, wildflower seeds. And it's taken a couple seasons, but it's just, it's really beautiful and great for the pollinators. And Which just leads to a whole nother lesson with kids. I know you do a lot of kids programming and stuff yes. and are going to do even more. It looks like you have a kid's garden behind us. We, we do have a children's garden we're very proud of. We're just kind of, it's in its infancy, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of things planned and we're excited about the lessons we're going to be having out there. So, what are, so what's some of the stuff that we can find over here? Well, this is our most recent flower bed. Um, we actually, we wanted to have a children's garden and we wanted it to be, it's actually planned for another area. Uh -huh. And then we decided this was the best location. So we had to move some things around that probably weren't appropriate for children's gardens, like a rose, rose bushes. Okay. And we had this area that to me looked like a butterfly. So we had a garden tour coming up last week and we decided let's just make it into the shape of a butterfly. So, you know, we, we dug it out and we put this the stones around the edging and have planted several annuals as you can see in there. Well it's definitely so. colorful and I know it will probably be attracting a few well, butterflies this well, summer we too. Hope so. so you've even got some games out here like the checkerboard and hopscotch. Yes, hopscotch for the kids, some activities. Um, we had another garden, this was where our roses were planted, uh -huh. but as, we, as I said we needed to transfer them somewhere else. So we decided to do a direct seeding project. And here again, I kind of looked at the shape of the bed that we had originally and decided, kind of looks like a heart. <laughs> you so were inspired by I was the inspired. Landscape. And um, so we kind of just thrown some seeds down there. And it's just an inexpensive way to start a garden. And we'll see how they do. And you and can see our little look, ladybugs kind of walking, their, making their way through there. It looks like there's some lines with sand. So are yes. those dividing them? Yes, we divided it up with sand. And so we kind of know, and then I marked it with your paint markers, or okay. paint stirs, um, to see how that would be. So we will see. Um, we also have a sensory garden. Our plans are to expand with this, but we want this for children to be able to touch and feel and smell. And uh, so this is the beginning of our sensory garden. So a lot have. of color and herbs. A lot of color and a lot of textures. herbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the plan. And then, so. of course, no garden is complete with some without some oh, activity this for is kids. Our, one of my favorite additions to the garden is this beautiful labyrinth. And um, a little different from a maze is you have to start at one side and go all the way to the very center uh -huh. of it. So they follow so the brick uh, They follow path. the brick pass, and we've had lots of volunteers that came in and helped um, bringing their own bricks, and somebody, a gentleman, that helped to create some bricks for us. Um, but we had some many hours of volunteer time is spent on this wonderful labyrinth. I bet. So, well, it's just beautiful. And what I yeah. love most about this is this is open to the public. A lot of your yes. plants, most of your plants are labeled mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people, you know, Enid has a different climate than some of the other Ex areas Exactly. The so state. much even from Stillwater to Enid. Yeah. And so we try and have a variety of Oklahoma proven 
uh, so they can come and see what we have and what does well here in Enid. What works in the, and, and, hot, and, dry, and windy the hot, dry, windy location out here. Well, so. thank you for sharing your garden with well, us. Well, thank you. So glad you could be here. just outside of Enid at Johnston Seed Company and joining me once again is John Lamley, our production uh, director. And John, so we've been following the blue bonnet seeds. Yep. Um, so what was the process after they finished blooming? Okay, after they finished blooming, they forced, formed pods similar to what you know you would see on soybeans. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what we do is once they get not completely dry or completely mature because native species typically like to shatter. Okay. So when they do get mature, they will, you know, of course the seed will, will fall out in various ways if you've seen a lot of plants in nature. So we have to come in a little bit early, sneak up on them, okay. to, so to speak, when they're a little green, and then we'll lay them down in a windrow. Allow that windrow to dry a lot, not completely in most cases, because if it gets completely dry, of course you'll see that shattering effect. This way we can get the plant material to dry somewhat, and then we'll come in pick up those windrows with a combine, uh, just like you would see, so you, you know, like canola. Them. Yes, we swat them, them. Okay. we swat them, put them in the windrow, okay. and then we'll come back through with the combine and pick up those windrows after a couple days. And of course, then once we get it in the combine, it's still got a little bit of moisture to it, so we have to bring it in, we have to dry it, which is what we have here on the tube, uh, and in which air pulls through it and can, completes the drying process. As you see many, of, like you saw in the field, the, the pods were still somewhat a little bit green, uh -huh. still intact in a lot of cases, plus there was loose seed also like we see here. But as time goes on, they dry, those pods will split open. Most of them will, not all of them, we'll still may have to mechanically knock some open. But as they split open, you'll hear them pop. And of course, as you see here, we have a lot of empty pods now. Yeah. And we'll take this and inside and process it. So we've got a lot of pods mixed with the seeds in right. here, and you've got this tube runs all the way through this pile here mm -hmm. that's pulling the air through it. And uh, just like I said, complete the drying process, but you can see in here, some of them are twisted, which means they're open, they're mm -hmm. empty, they'll easily remove through the cleaning process. Of course, some like this one is still, still a little tough. It was probably a little greener when we harvested, so it doesn't open up as easy. Okay. So we'll mechanically bust those and uh, try and get the seed out. You can see the seeds a little lighter color because it was a little less mature at the time, although it's probably still viable. Okay. So how long will you leave these drying? Uh, it just depends on the weather, uh, some of the humidity in the air, uh, as long as possible until we can, you know, until we can take it inside and clean it. Uh, we like to get the moisture down you know, 10%, just like, you know, 10, 12%, just like a farmer would with wheat or something like okay. that. Get the moisture, that way, once we get it processed, put in the bag, it won't spoil. We, we can't have any moisture because in your germination, it'll be affected germination and bad things and happen And that leads to mold and mildew That's within exactly your right. seeds, right. It, should, it stores best at the lowest possible moisture. Okay. And so that's what we're shooting for. So once it's dried, then what's the next step? We gotta we'll, get them, uh, some of these holes we'll out We'll take the of skid loader, it. stick the skid loader, pick it up, put it in a truck or a grain cart, haul it over, put it into the, in the cleaning facility, and uh, we'll process it through a series of screens, and uh, which will remove those empty pods with the, probably most likely the empty ones, from the, the holes, I'd say, through the air. The full pods will still scalp over the top and we'll reprocess those and as eventually everything goes into just a small loose seed uh, with air, set of screens, we'll clean it to probably 99% plus purity. And when you say the air, the air actually is shooting There's actually some of the stuff? Actually it's pulling air, it's like a, like a vacuum on it, okay. so all the lighter stuff material will be sucked off okay. as it flows through the system. Okay. And then there's, you know, if there's any issues with weed, there's, there's additional equipment or machines that we may require to get out some problem issues, but 
based on what I saw in the field and the crop, I think we're fine. Well, once we go through the screen process, we should be good to go. So we'll after you've sell. screened your seed, is that ready to be packaged? or what's Actually, it? It will, what we'll do is we'll, we'll do initial testing on it. We'll send it off to a lab. Um, they will do check the purity and the, germ the germination on it. Mm -hmm. And if that's all satisfactory, then uh, we will take that that seed and then of course package it as we're you know whatever the end consumer is going to buy it in whether it's a 50 pound bag or a two pound bag or a four pound just depends on what the end consumer what their uh, what the demand is. Okay so you can kind of custom Yes we kind of custom that. do it and we're most of this most of the blue bonds typically will go into the wholesale market basically to Texas okay uh, if, if you know if the crop's short down there or we might even carry over some seed just depends on what the demand is this year. And we've seen in this process a lot of other wildflowers that you're mm -hmm. growing here also, um, some of the lead plant and purple prairie mm -hmm. clover. Is the process similar for those? It or? is very similar. Uh, we, we, once again, once it once it gets close to maturity, not mm -hmm. completely mature, because like I said, they tend to see the shatter. So we, you sneak up on them, you try to kind of harvest them a little bit of green and lay them down, put them in the Because that's the worst thing if they start shattering. If they start the shattering, you, you basically lost, you lost it. Yeah. I mean, if they, you, you want a little bit because because being a wild species they don't all mature evenly mm -hmm. so it prevents you from like direct combining in a lot of cases okay. and that's why we try to put it in the wind row to let it dry but some of it's going to be you'll still see maybe a few blooms in the field when your heart when you're swathing it mm -hmm. versus you'll see some of the shatter so you got to pick that fine line in there where you maximize your yield uh, hope the weather doesn't get you like it did on some of the blue bonnets and uh, then we'll go ahead and combine it pick it up bring it in finish drying it, and then we'll run through the process just like this. Okay, and of course, you have wildflowers that are gonna continue blooming throughout all into the fall, mm -hmm. right? So you'll be doing this process over and over. It's, it's kind of a continual because, which is a nice thing for like the pollinator species. Mm -hmm. We don't want them all blooming at once. So we, we started with the blue bonnets in this case, and I'll probably finish up with the maximum sunflower. And there's oxide daisy, there's the purple prairie clover, the lead plant, the uh, Illinois bundle flower, the partridge pea, uh, <laughs> Some others I've probably left out that'll continually go. So that's why when you do a pollinator, they do a pollinator mix, not just a pollinator species. Right. That way there's a constant blooming throughout the season to, you know, for the monarchs as well as like the pollinator species, there's constant food source all the way through the season. Excellent. Well, John, this has been fantastic. And sure. thank you for sharing the story before the seed gets into the sure. package. You're more than welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. It's fall and it's time for the trees to change their color of their leaves. And actually all those yellows and oranges and reds you see in the fall are there year round in the leaf. It's just that the chlorophyll, which is green, masks all the other colors. So to show you that all the other colors are in there during the rest of the year, we have an activity where we're gonna separate out the colors in the leaves so you can actually see the yellows and the greens in, at the same time. So just like markers, like a, this is a purple marker and purple is red and blue. All right, we took a purple marker and we did the same thing we're gonna do to these leaves. We put rubbing alcohol on some purple marker and it separated out into the different colors. 
and this is a brown marker that we did the same thing to. So it's separated out into the colors that are always there, but you can't see them because they're masked by the overall color. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take some leaves and we're going to use rubbing alcohol and coffee filters, since you should have some of those at your house, and we're going to do a fun little activity to show where the colors are all year round. So this is a tree I did last week. That's a golden rain tree. So you can see the green chlorophyll and then you can see the yellow that was gonna, is going to show up in a few weeks. These are actually from the lettuce mix that we bought at a grocery store. And since they are plants and they are leaves, they have chlorophyll, but you can also see a little bit of yellow and even a little bit of red there. So you can use something that you already have around your house, like spinach, or you can go out while the leaves are still green and collect some from your yard and do what we're about ready to do. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is collect some leaves, and then we have to mash them up to get all the good juices out from inside that have all the colors. So I collected some leaves. These are from a Japanese maple, and I'm just going to mush them up using a mortar and pestle. I also have done some of these before where I just cut them up and then mash them in the bottom of a cup with the back end of a marker. So you don't have to have a mortar and pestle. You can just use whatever you have to mash up some leaves. Because what we're interested in are the juices on the inside of the leaves. So you don't want to use some that are dried up. You want to get some that still have the juices. Now if you notice, it looks like the only color in here is green, but we're going to find out shortly that that's not the case. There's enough to get us started. So what we're going to do is we're going to pour some rubbing alcohol. So we have a little bit of rubbing alcohol and our torn up leaves. So I'm just going to grind them and mash them so that we end up with the pigments. And you can tell the rubbing alcohol is getting some of the pigments in it and turning the rubbing alcohol green and some other colors too. All right, looks like we've got some pretty good mashed up leaves and their juice in there. So we're gonna now go to the second phase, which is to put it on coffee filter paper and let the colors separate out. Since each color is a different molecule, they move through filter paper at slightly different rates and that's what helps them separate out. Okay, so the next step is to transfer the juice with the pigment in it to the coffee filter paper, which will separate out the different pigments. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try just to get the juice and we're gonna drop it slowly in the middle of the coffee filter and not soak it enough that there's a hole in the middle of the coffee filter, but just keep replenishing it so it'll have enough juice to separate out. You can start to see some of the colors coming out to the side there. And if you look really closely, you can see yellow leading the way. So what happens is, during the summertime, the chlorophyll is doing most of the work, but there's other colors in the leaves besides chlorophyll that catch the wavelengths of light that the chlorophyll can't absorb. That way it's pretty efficient. So in the fall, the chlorophyll starts to break down, and what you see are the other colors that get masked the rest of the year. Okay, so this takes a while, as you can tell, but if you keep applying it, and you're patient, after a while you can stop applying it and let it dry and it'll be more obvious where the yellow and the green are. Now the reds and the oranges sometimes aren't in particular species and sometimes it takes like a freeze or close to a freeze to have the chemical reactions to cause those colors. But you should be able to find green and yellow inside most leaves. So if we're patient and we let this dry then eventually it'll look like this, where it's pretty obvious where the green and yellow are, although you can start to see it forming right there. So this is a science project you could do right now before the leaves start to change color, and all you need is a coffee filter and some rubbing alcohol.
There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we continue our tour of gardening in Northwest Oklahoma with a visit to Paxaddle Wildlife Management Area with OSU Extension Wildlife Specialist Dwayne Elmore. Dr. Elmore takes us on a walk through a waist-high forest, and we examine the plants and soils of Ellis County. Casey will have five great plants with white blooms, and Shelly Mitchell will be back with another fun children's activity for fall. The nights are getting cooler, but there's still lots to see and do. So join us again next week for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.